Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper by looking at a column from page number six of the Delhi edition. This column deals with the current status of India's relations with Africa. It has been written by Mr. Rajiv Bhatia, a former Indian diplomat who has served in African countries, and hence he is able to provide great insight into India's African diplomacy. See, India and Africa. share very strong civilizational and cultural relations the two civilizations have been connected since the ancient and medieval times and there also happens to be a very strong cultural connect between the two regions in the modern world our independent struggles were linked due to our shared colonial history and mahatma gandhi in particular and gandhian philosophy was something that connected the independent struggles of both the regions After India became independent in 1947 it continued strongly backing decolonization across Africa and India along with several African nations they took a strong stand against imperialism and colonialism and as the global world order got divided during the cold war India along with several African nations like Egypt they championed the non aligned movement to represent the third world countries which refused to choose between the two power blocks So over the last several decades India and African countries they have championed south south diplomacy or south south cooperation which refers to cooperation between developing and underdeveloped nations of the world This partnership between India and Africa can be seen at various platforms including at the United Nations the WTO the climate change convention etc Especially after the cold war ended in 1991 India started diversifying its relations and it started paying more attention towards the African region. As the Indian economy started witnessing exponential growth, India felt the need for new markets and resources and Africa was an ideal partner for India. Especially in the last couple of decades, India has prioritized its relations with Africa and both the Vajpayee government and the Manmohan Singh government took several steps to scale up indian diplomacy and indian initiatives in africa india has been providing a lot of development assistance to some of the poor african countries by announcing grants line of credit and concessional loans and it has become one of the key investors in several african nations and in countries which have been affected by conflict and socio ethnic tensions india has been playing a key role in restoring normalcy and in conflict management through the un peacekeeping forces because india has been one of the largest contributor of troops to the un peacekeeping forces and they have been deployed in several countries such as drc or the democratic republic of congo south sudan etc today the key pillar for india in africa is the african union which is a regional organization that represents more than 50 african countries in order to scale up india's african diplomacy India established the India Africa Forum Summit with the African Union countries in 2008 and this marked the highest elevation of ties between India and Africa. This summit has been held in 2011 and 2015 as well and this signifies the close political, economic and strategic relations between India and African nations. Even the current Modi government has continued this policy towards Africa. and through several new initiatives it continues to treat africa as a foreign policy priority the modi government has continued the high level political engagement with key african countries and it has been displaying the necessary political will of late india has stepped up assistance to african countries especially after the pandemic broke out under mission sagar india not only dispatched essential medicines and medical equipment to neighboring countries in south asia and the indian ocean region but the indian navy also supplied these essential emergency items to several east african countries as well then under vaccine maitri india supplied initial batches of vaccines to several african countries in fact for several decades india's generic drugs and india's pharmaceutical industry has been the backbone of africa's healthcare program and india has also been playing a key role in strengthening education and healthcare in africa in fact india has taken up a major soft power initiative in africa 
known as the Pan African E Network project which was envisioned by former president APJ Abdul Kalam this is essentially a ICT project that is based on information and communications technology through which isro satellites are being used to provide for telemedicine and teleeducation in african countries the first phase of this project was launched back in 2009 and nearly 49 countries have been covered under this project under this initiative several elite educational institutions of india and leading medical colleges and hospitals of india are connected with african institutions and they are offering high quality education and healthcare services for free currently phase 2 of this project has also been taken up to further expand its reach and to even cover the areas of banking e-commerce etc despite having such close relations the writer flags an emerging concern in the relationship he refers to the bilateral trading relationship between india and africa and based on latest data he points out the decline in the trading relations see if you look at india's key export markets in africa it includes countries like south africa nigeria egypt kenya and togo indian exports to africa is mainly comprised of processed petroleum products under the category of mineral fuels and oils and as well as pharmaceutical products and vehicles these are the top 3 exports from india to african countries then the major sources for indian imports include south africa nigeria egypt angola and guinea these indian imports are comprised of mineral fuels and oils especially crude oil and as well as pearls and precious and semi precious stones as per latest trade data made available by the confederation of indian industries for the financial year 2020-21 indian exports to africa stood at 27.7 billion dollars this represents a 4.4% decline in exports as compared to the previous year and indian imports from africa stood at just 28.2 billion dollars which is a 25% reduction in indian imports as compared to the previous year the overall bilateral trade which was valued at 55.9 billion dollars in 2020-21 saw a reduction of 10.8 billion dollars as compared to the previous year even indian investments in africa have declined over the last one year and according to data indian investments in africa for 2019-20 stood at 3.2 billion dollars but for 2020-21 it had declined to 2.9 billion dollars over the last 25 years that is between 1996 and 2021 indian investors have invested just around 70 billion dollars in africa this is just one third of the investments that china has made in the region during the same period china has invested a whopping 200 plus billion dollars which is more than three times the indian investment in africa while this decline in bilateral trade and investments might be a result of the pandemic and the pandemic induced economic slowdown it would be important to note that if this decline in trade investments and economic relations sustains then it could lead to the overall weakening of the relations between india and africa because currently in africa we are witnessing intense competition between several global powers which are fighting over african resources the major competitors include china the united states european union japan and the others of course india is also one of the significant powers vying for influence in africa Amongst all these powers China and United States in particular are way ahead as they enjoy enormous economic diplomatic and strategic influence in African nations All these powers including India they have been providing a lot of assistance to African countries over the years in order to help the small and poor African countries which are facing several developmental challenges But in return for this assistance and these investments they are looking for geopolitical influence in these countries along with their desire to get a hold on african resources the writer suggests that in this pursuit the biggest competitor for india would be china which is already many steps ahead and hence one of the best options for india would be to work out joint partnerships with like minded countries such as japan european countries and the us to step up joint initiatives and joint investments 
in order to protect its interests against any Chinese threat. See, the latest decline in our trading relationship is a result of the pandemic and the slowdown, and also because India has been preoccupied with other geopolitical challenges, such as its ongoing tensions with China and Pakistan. So, if India has to revive the trading relationship and if it has to re energize its diplomacy towards Africa, then first it needs to start paying adequate attention towards individual African countries and as well as towards regional groupings of Africa. India will have to step up its bilateral engagement with key African powers such as South Africa, Nigeria and Egypt. And it will also have to engage closely with important regional groupings like the African Union, SADC, COMESA, etc. Then it has been nearly six years since the last India-Africa Forum Summit was held. So India has to immediately call for a new summit as soon as possible in order to show to the African countries that the region continues to remain a foreign policy priority for India. During these interactions, India will have to announce new initiatives, especially more assistance, including line of credit, loans, concessional loans and grants, so that India continues to remain relevant in Africa by helping out the small and poor countries with the developmental challenges that they are facing. For example, India can step up the pandemic-related assistance, including the supply of vaccines and supply of essential medical equipment, including ventilators. Apart from these initiatives, India will have to look for joint partnerships with like-minded countries, such as the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor that India has been pursuing with Japan. On similar lines, recently India and the European Union have also agreed to take up joint partnership in Africa. India could pursue something similar with the quadrilateral grouping as well, as the Quad is focused on the Indo-Pacific region and Africa, the east coast of Africa, is a very integral part of the Indo-Pacific. So the members of Quad, including US, Australia, Japan and India, they can take up several joint initiatives and parallelly if India works with European countries and if it steps up the Asia-Africa growth corridor with Japan, then India would get a chance to counter Chinese influence in Africa. Now let's take up another column from page number 6, which evaluates the contribution of the rural economy and the distress being faced by it. See, the rural economy is seen as one of the key drivers of the Indian economy. Because even today, millions of people, nearly 60% of India's workforce is employed in the rural sector. And it is still one of the key drivers with regard to creation of jobs, income support, and it helps in creating the kind of demand push that is required to trigger growth in the overall Indian economy. When I say rural economy, we are of course referring to the agriculture sector and as well as to the non-farm sector. This rural economy contributes significantly to India's GDP growth and it is one of the primary sources of employment and income security for a vast majority of the country's population. This key driver of the Indian economy has been hit very hard as a result of the pandemic, the lockdowns, and as well as by the economic mismanagement of the government and some of the poorly designed economic policies of the government. See, even before the pandemic, the Indian economy was witnessing a structural slowdown for the last four years, and India's GDP growth had fallen to just around 4%. During this period of structural slowdown, the neglect of the rural sector was already affecting agriculture and non farm work, and job losses and income insecurity was already being reported in the rural areas. Now, the pandemic and the lockdowns have only accelerated this distress. And hence, today the rural economy has come under a lot of strain. Upon this, the lockdowns have rendered migrant workers jobless in Indian cities and lakhs of them have been pushed back into the rural areas where they have again found support in agriculture and in other traditional non-farm labor. So as a result, it becomes all the more important for the government to provide adequate attention to the rural sector, that is to both agriculture and non-farm sector, because it is not just the backbone of the Indian economy, but it is also the key driver of demand in the Indian economy. As long as the rural population is employed, and as long as they are earning enough income through agriculture and to other non-farm labor, that is when a strong demand can be sustained in the economy which helps in driving India's overall GDP growth. But the second wave of the pandemic 
has already had a devastating impact on the rural areas and many families have even lost their breadwinners upon this the lack of government support during the pandemic has increased out of pocket healthcare expenditure for many rural families and this has pushed the rural population into severe economic distress so in the coming months we are going to witness increase in poverty levels in the rural areas and many rural families including farmers might fall under debt traps and debt burdens as their non institutional borrowing from money lenders might have gone up so the right to cautions the government about the looming agricultural crisis and the crisis in the rural economy and he points out how the government and the institutions are underestimating the distress according to him the official data and the numbers that are available they do not truly capture the exact distress being faced in the rural areas and even though the government and the rbi came out with some support last year when the pandemic broke out these measures are simply not sufficient to elevate the rural economy the rbi did announce some monetary policy measures and even the government came out with few support schemes last year initially during the lockdowns the government did provide for some cash transfer to the vulnerable sections particularly in the rural areas but this time these cash transfers have been stopped the government has extended the free food grain scheme that is the pradhan mantri garib kalyan anna yojana under which free food grains is being distributed to the rural poor who have been severely affected by the pandemic and the lockdowns even though this key food security scheme has been extended it only provides for basic cereals and food grains but it does not include pulses as it was provided last year then upon this the government has not increased the allocation this year for important schemes such as manrega schemes such as manrega they guarantee employment in the rural areas especially during times of distress and they help in sustaining millions of livelihoods but in this year's budget the allocation for manrega has not seen any major increase then upon this farmers in the country are facing a peculiar situation wherein agricultural input prices have increased due to a significant rise in international prices of important commodities including diesel and fertilizers even the government has not capped these prices and it has not brought down its taxes on these essential commodities so for farmers the agricultural input prices have gone up and while these essential agricultural imports are facing inflation the domestic agricultural prices of agricultural output has gone down thereby fetching lesser income for the farmers so with regard to agricultural input the expenditures of farmers has gone up due to inflation whereas their income is coming down due to reduction in domestic prices of vegetables cereals and other domestic products whereas imported agricultural products such as pulses edible oils etc their prices have gone up significantly and this peculiar situation is having a huge impact on the rural economy then upon this there has been a general decline in rural wages including non farm wages and all these factors has created a deadly combination of inflation unemployment falling wages accompanied with a deadly pandemic this has pushed the rural areas into a dire situation and as a result there has been a massive decline in the rural demand and one lesson is clear for all of us if rural demand falls then the overall demand in the indian economy will also fall thereby leading to economic stagnation hence the right calls for immediate measures to be taken by the government to revive demand in the rural economy and one of the best and most efficient ways of doing it is by providing for cash transfers to the rural areas accompanied with agricultural subsidies to bring down the input prices this strategy has already worked for india once when the indian economy was severely hit during the 2008-9 global financial crisis following this crisis india did come out with monetary and fiscal policies to boost overall indian economic growth and large scale stimulus was provided for various sectors but one of the key interventions that was carried out was to increase rural demand by putting more money in the hands of the rural people especially that of the farmers that is where schemes such as manrega became critical and through targeted subsidies and intervention the government was able to put more money in the hands of the rural people as their purchasing power goes up rural demand will also go up thereby contributing to a overall growth in the indian economy in fact 
this analysis is even supported by sufficient data because in the last 5 years when the overall indian economy was suffering and even though the overall gross value added economic growth stood at just 3.6% the average growth rate in the agriculture sector during the same time period stood at 4.8% which was significantly higher than the overall gva growth in the indian economy this clearly shows that if the government carries out the right intervention in the rural economy that is in the agriculture sector and as well as in the non farm economy then it can definitely boost rural demand which in turn can trigger growth in the overall economy so the writer says that if the government reverses this neglect of the rural areas and if it shows willingness to correct the policy missteps then history and past data clearly shows that the rural sector has the resilience to withstand these dire economic circumstances and with the right kind of support the rural economy can indeed jump start a revival in the overall indian economy next on page number 1 and 8 we have an article that refers to the important all party meeting that the prime minister had called for over the political and constitutional future of jammu and kashmir during this important meeting a cordial interaction took place between the central leaders and leaders of jammu and kashmir representing various parties and both the sides have frankly expressed their opinions the prime minister has called for promoting grassroots democracy in jammu and kashmir in order to bring about development and progress in the region while acknowledging the need to win the hearts and minds of the local people which is a clear recognition of the trust deficit that exists between delhi and j and k the prime minister has made it clear that the top priority for now would be the immediate conduct of a delimitation exercise which would help in drawing up the constituencies that are needed for holding assembly elections for the union territory because remember j and k is a union territory with an elected legislative assembly the center has said that once delimitation is done and once the assembly elections are held then the center will definitely consider the restoration of complete statehood to jammu and kashmir whereas the opposition parties on the other hand especially the regional parties they have made it clear to the center that even though they are willing to engage in a political dialogue with the center to bridge the trust deficit they are not ready to accept the unilateral changes that were made on the 5th of august 2019 with regard to the special status of jammu and kashmir under article 317 and they still consider these changes and the manner in which it was introduced to be illegal and unconstitutional and hence they would continue fighting this as a legal battle at the supreme court well within the norms of the indian constitution without taking matters into their hand so these parties have clearly reiterated their commitment to the indian constitution and to the law of the land but their legal challenge at the supreme court against these changes to article 370 and the status of jammu and kashmir which they deem to be illegal and unconstitutional shall continue while these parties have expressed support for the delimitation exercise and the assembly elections their primary demand has been for the restoration of statehood they've asked the center to first restore statehood and then look at delimitation and conduct of elections but the center on the other hand has taken the opposite stand and the center's priority for now is to first conduct the delimitation exercise then hold the assembly elections and then restore statehood to jammu and kashmir the opposition parties have also raised other key issues such as the restoration of a jammu and kashmir cadre in the bureaucracy and as well as the need to protect the land rights of the people of jammu and kashmir which has been eroded since these constitutional changes were introduced so these talks have set the stage for a more permanent dialogue between new delhi and jammu and kashmir but to gauge its success and to see whether it will bridge the trust deficit we need to wait and watch now let's look at this article from page number 8 the narcotics control bureau has arrested the key accused belonging to a pakistan based drug trafficking cartel who were caught by the border security force when they were smuggling drugs into india across the border these accused have been booked by the ncb under the provisions of the narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act and as well as under other relevant provisions and this article brings us to the topic of border management challenges along the india pakistan border and helps us understand how drug trafficking is one of the major organized crimes which is witnessed along the india pakistan border 
See, India has always been a major victim of organized crime, such as drug trafficking, arms trafficking, humans trafficking, and as well as trafficking of wildlife products, because India is surrounded by two major crime hubs and hubs of drugs and narcotics production, that is the Golden Crescent region and the Golden Triangle region. The Golden Crescent, present on India's western borders, covers Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the Golden Triangle on our eastern borders stretches across Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and other countries. Afghanistan, in particular, is a major producer of drugs and various opioids, including opium and other narcotic substances, which in turn is smuggled into India and as well as around the world, with the help of Pakistani intelligence agency the ISI, which has links with various drug cartels in the region. Drug trafficking is one of the ways through which finances are raised for terror outfits and it also helps the ISI fund its covert war against India. So along this stretch of the India-Pakistan border, drug trafficking and drug smuggling is a major menace and hence it becomes important to understand the border management challenges along the India-Pakistan border. See, this border runs along the states of Gujarat, Rajasthan, Punjab, and Jammu and Kashmir. This border, which is roughly around 3,323 kilometers in length, can be divided into the international border and the LOC or the line of control. The international border refers to the settled boundaries between India and Pakistan, which runs along Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Punjab. Over here, we don't have any border disputes, and hence, this is the international border, the final settled boundary between the two countries. Whereas in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan has illegally occupied several territories claimed by India, including Gilgit Baltistan. And the current ceasefire line over here is the LOC or the line of control. So essentially, India shares two kinds of boundaries with Pakistan. See, along the LOC in Jammu and Kashmir, the major threat faced by India is the problem of infiltration of terrorists with the help of the Pakistani army. But along the international border, we don't witness infiltration of terrorists and we don't have border disputes. But however, we face many other challenges such as the trafficking of drugs, smuggling and the provision of logistical support for terrorist outfits. So tackling these border management challenges along the India-Pakistan border lies with the BSF or the Border Security Force, which is the designated border guarding force along this border. In the Kutch sector of Gujarat, there is one small stretch where the border is not clearly demarcated because of the ongoing dispute over the Sir Creek region. But apart from this minor dispute, the entire stretch of the international border is free from disputes. But the presence of organized crime and smuggling is posing a threat to India's internal security. So India's response has been to step up its border management and as well as border security in order to plug these gaps which is being exploited by organized criminal cartels with the support of Pakistan's ISI. So several physical measures have been taken along the border, such as fencing of the entire border, and the whole border has been floodlit as well. Along with this, the BSF has been deploying high-end technology to step up its surveillance. And today, India is using drones, satellite-based reconnaissance, CCTV cameras, laser and thermal-based sensors, night vision goggles and as well as ground scanners in order to detect any infiltration attempts or any movement and also to detect the presence of tunnels. And these are the border security measures that are being deployed along the India-Pakistan border. Now let's look at this article from page number 9. India has confirmed for the first time that the MEA, the Ministry of External Affairs, has been in contact with several stakeholders in Afghanistan. This statement by the MEA and this acknowledgement by the government provides partial confirmation to reports that India has been engaging in secret talks with representatives of the Taliban for the first time as the American troops in Afghanistan are withdrawing and as the political future of Afghanistan is going to be determined in the coming months. Previously, there were reports that Indian representatives from MEA and from its intelligence agency, the RAW, were holding secret talks with Taliban members at Doha and now the ministry has given partial confirmation that these contacts have been going on in order to protect Indian interests in Afghanistan. This confirmation comes in the backdrop of the interaction that took place between the national security advisors of India and Pakistan who met a couple of days ago during the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's meeting 
in Tajikistan. During this meeting at the SCO platform, the NSAs of India and Pakistan, they have discussed the future of Afghanistan and the question of terrorism, including the need to act against Pakistan-based terror outfits such as the Lashkar-e Toiba and the Jaish e Mohammed. See, under the SEO, there is an anti-terror platform known as RATS. It stands for Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure. This provides a platform for the SEO members to discuss counter-terror measures for Central Asia and for the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. And India has been trying to use this platform to work with Pakistan to target these terrorist outfits. Right now, Pakistan is under tremendous pressure as it faces further actions being taken by the Financial Action Task Force for its failure to act against terror financing. So India is trying to use this opportunity to work with Pakistan at the RATS platform of the SEO to jointly target these terror outfits. And parallelly, India has most likely opened direct talks with few members of the Taliban so that Indian interests are protected if the Taliban were to come to power in Afghanistan. Now let's look at the main practice questions. The first question, India's Africa policy needs to be re-energized. Discuss. The second question, examine the contribution of the rural sector to the Indian economy. In the midst of the pandemic, how can the rural economy jumpstart an overall revival in the economy? Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for today. Thanks for watching.